to creation in the 21st century. I'm your host, Carl Ball, founder and director of the Creation Evidence Museum in Glen Rose, Texas. Each of these programs is designed with you in mind, designed to dispense information that is vital to your life. Well, the program today is a program with information that you should know. Uh, in fact, the question is, uh, why would rocks be laid in the sedimentary deposits that we find them? Well, the program title is Stones Cry Out. In the 19th chapter of the book of Luke, there's an amazing portion of scripture where Jesus is riding on Palm Sunday on the back of a donkey. And by the way, that is an amazing statement. That was a colt on which man never sat. And Jesus was the first person ever to ride him. Now, if you know anything about farm animals, you know that normally they're quite reluctant, belligerent, and disposed to violence when you first try to ride them. But not so. This was the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. This was the God of the universe, the creator in human flesh. And as he dispersed the violence of the waves and calmed the sea and walked on the billows as if pavement, so he could ride on the little colt as if that colt had been predestined from eternity past to be his vehicle, and he was. So as Jesus rode on that little colt, people took off their outer garments and cast them in the path for the donkey to walk over. And then people took palm branches, cut them off the trees, waved them and cried, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. It was a marvelous date. In fact, it was a fulfillment date. For over 776,000 days before, the forecast had been given that uh, when the decree is given for Artaxerxes to announce the rebuilding of the temple, specifically a number of days as described in the original language, would be fulfilled and then the king would present himself. And Jesus said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets. On that day, he said, weeping over Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how oft would I have gathered thee together as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, but ye would not. Their personal responsibility in choice and their disposition to self-will remove them from the blessings of Almighty God on that occasion. So it was a great day. It was a prophetically fulfilled day. It was the day when the King of Glory rode on one mark of his creation, and it was right that people would cry, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. But there were cynics in the background. There were individuals who cried, now wait a minute, these people are making too much noise. Quieten them down. And Jesus said, I tell you, anytime Jesus raises his finger and points it at your face, you'd better listen. Jesus said, I tell you, that if these, my friends, my disciples, my representatives, if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Now, cynics over the years have said, well, now, Jesus was apparently given to a bit of exaggeration. The stones cry out? Some years ago, some geophysicists began to examine the molecular structure of rocks, and they found that when there is vibratory energy, such as a voice speaking in the presence of certain stones, there's a molecular shift on the surface of that stone that changes and actually records, much like a magnetic tape records our voices in production, in electronics. Many of the same physical principles are at work, and actually that rock holds the recording of that voice. In fact, some scientists have postulated that the day may come when we have appropriate detecting instruments 
The day may come that we can actually again hear the voices of individuals in the past who spoke in the presence of rocks, particularly those with very hard surfaces. The only problem is when someone else speaks or when there's another vibratory bit of information and disturbance passing over that rock, it uh, jumbles the information quite a bit. So it would take the Creator himself to detect that. But I'm saying that everything he stated was absolutely true. Stones have the potential of recording, and with the proper detecting instruments, the potential is there for them to make a statement. Well now, let's term this program Stones Cry Out. That title gives us an introduction. The rocks of the earth have a lot to say to us, and we're going to have to settle for using symbology in the rocks because I do not have and I don't think any individual has the proper detecting and replaying instruments but the principle is clear the rocks will cry out what do those rocks tell us today now my associates and I work in rocks in the audience observing in the gallery observing this particular telecast being recorded uh, is one geologist there's a cryptozoologist uh, there is a petroleum engineer. These individuals examine data and uh, feed to me information. How do I get all the information that I communicate to you on these programs? Well, I certainly don't have time to personally research it all. I have friends like this who give me such information, and at the right moment, it is related to you. So here's some of that information. We work in the rocks. In fact, this is... Uh, one of the displays of our work, uh, and this is on display at the Creation Evidence Museum. That is, this photograph is, and we bring much of the data and uh, the uh, rocks and the samples and the fossils and the replicas here for recording on the program. Now, uh, this is Joe Taylor, my primary excavator. I'm the director of this entire project, and years ago I did all of my uh, excavating. I wouldn't let anyone touch a track that I was excavating or a bone that I was excavating, but after a while I learned that the director has other responsibilities, so you get good lieutenants around you. And one of those very fine lieutenants is excavator and preparator Joe Taylor. So Joe Taylor is shown here in this photograph, and here we have the articulated vertebral column of a huge sauropod dinosaur. Now, articulated, what does that mean? That means that that vertebrae is in place with that vertebrae in place with that vertebrae in place with that vertebrae. How did we find this? Well, around the edge of this bluff, I found a tiny little bone about the size of the tip of my little finger. And I called the little girl and her foster grandmother who had led me to the area uh, they were looking at other fragments in a gully nearby. But I was interested in this particular layer because I saw discoloration. There's some of the discoloration that I saw that led me to examine this area. And uh, when the discovery was made, the face of the cliff went, uh, came out much closer to the camera angle. So I found a tiny little bone, a uh, little dinosaur bone about the size of the tip of my little finger. And I called to the little 11-year-old girl, come up, I want to show you something. So I said, watch. As I uncovered it, I said, it'll get longer and longer, and then it terminated. And I said, help me. This is a dinosaur bone. We might find a dinosaur. So she dug a while and then went back. I called her back, and I said, look, help me. I'll show you what to do. So she dug in the side of that clay and rock, and then I went past her, struck a couple of times, into the face surface which was much closer to the camera and on the second or third strike I hit the end of a big femur that femur turned out to be 16 one and a half inches long connected to another bone another and another and finally we have all of these bones now from that location we have currently excavated 12 different dinosaurs now there are more to come because the bones just keep showing up and showing up